Hi, I'm Heather Staker. Welcome to our Facilitator First Friday, this first Friday of February. There's a lot of Fs for you of 2019. We're talking today about the micro trend and some of these trends we've seen around the use of the word micro in education. We hear about micro schools, micro credentials, and other cases of that term. And we're going to talk about that today. Our intention with having these facilitator calls is to equip you with information and skills to inspire you and to connect our network so that we're more effective leaders and facilitators as we go forth and help move the word forward with student-centered learning. So thank you for taking the time to tune in or to watch this after the fact. And I hope that these will be helpful to you and that you'll feel connected to this network and know that you always have a place here with our extended network of over 150 facilitators. There is always a group here that's here to support you and to help you on your journey and to cheer you on and to provide resources for you. That's our intention and we will be here for you. We're not going anywhere. I'd like to welcome Teresa Carter, your facilitator concierge, who, uh, as you know, is always there to help set up your workshops and um, provide any resource that you need as you're moving forward with your work. And then also Allison Powell, who's our guest participant today. She is the senior learning strategist at Bloomboard, and I've known Allison for a long time. She formerly was the vice president at INACL, the International Association of K-12 Online Learning, and she um, did such tremendous work there. I've been reading her research for years, working with her at pre-conference sessions at the big INACL conference for years, and so we've gone way back, and now we have the pleasure of doing some work together on micro-credentials, which we'll talk about in a moment. She's also helping to lead the Digital Learning Annual conference, a new conference that's in Austin, in fact, in April. And so she's been doing a lot of work with that, and I'll be presenting with her there. So Allison, welcome. We're excited Thank to hear from you in a minute. So I want to begin today with a little bit of um, theory and context to tee up the conversation with Allison. If you'll recall from the book Blended, we talk in that book about the theory of interdependence and modularity, and it harkens back to some engineering concepts around product architecture. When we talk about product architecture, we're referring to all of the components and subsystems and how they fit together. So for example, a lampshade, the architecture of that includes the shade and the, the light bulb and the power cord and the stand. Those are all of the different components of that system. The interface is where those components meet up. So where the light bulb actually screws into the pedestal would be an interface. Where the plug plugs into the wall would be an interface. So those are different vocabulary words when we talk about product architecture. And I think that they're helpful as we're looking now at changes that are happening in education. Because what we're seeing is that education used to have an interdependent product architecture, meaning that in the early days when something's first forming and the interfaces are not very well understood, it's not clear yet how the different components need to fit together, what happens is that whoever's building that product or service tends to integrate them, integrate everything in together. Everything's too messy to be able to specify the different component parts and how they should interface. And so the, the person who's delivering that product or service has to integrate everything together. An example is that Lockheed Martin F-22 fighter jet on the right, where when that was first being built, it was so complicated. It was so um, fancy. It had so many new features and the interfaces were messy. It wasn't yet clear. You couldn't just go down um, the store and buy a new component if something on that thing broke. You had to go back to Lockheed Martin and have it fixed because everything was proprietary. It was a very interdependent structure. Whereas on the left, that lamp, it's become more modular. The interfaces are better understood. We're able to say we need this size light bulb and anyone could get on Amazon or go to Walmart and buy a light bulb that's compatible with that lamp because we understand those interfaces. Similarly, you could plug that into any electrical outlet in America and it would fit because the interface between the electrical power cord and the socket are well known enough that we can have modularity. What we've seen in education is that for years we've had these comprehensive high schools, these comprehensive public schools 
that have been interdependent, where everything's integrated together because the interfaces aren't well understood. What is happening now that's unusual and brings opportunity is the rise of modularity in education, where we're starting to have more um, cleaner interfaces and better understood specifications such that we can modularize. So there's a lot of theory to explain why I think that micro is becoming a big word in education. What we're seeing is the rise of the constituent components of the system living on their own and plugging in and snapping into the system in a modular way instead of one fully comprehensive system in an interdependent way bringing the whole solution. So let me give you an example. Scroll to the next slide for me, Allison. Thank you. This is my brother's brand new website. He is opening a series of five micro schools in the greater Salt Lake City, Utah area. He's calling them Slope School to serve families that are moving to Utah to um, participate in the burgeoning Silicon Slopes economy that's kind of developed around from like Provo up to Salt Lake City. And he is opening these micro schools. And the reason that it's possible for him to do that is because now he has a background in Goldman, with Goldman Sachs. He worked for a while for Acton Academy, which is a big network of micro schools. As you know, my family attends in Austin. But the reason that it's possible for a school like a slope school to be attractive is that the number one reason that small schools weren't attractive in the past is that they couldn't offer all of the different opportunities and learning um, courses and just the comprehensive nature of those big schools. Um, and so people didn't want them. People wanted to send their children to a school that had more opportunity. So small schools were only desirable to the select few who were okay with a smaller menu set. What's changed now is because of the modular, the rise of modular architecture in education, it's possible for someone like Matt Clayton, my younger brother, to secure a lease on a property, to hire some guides, to put up a website, and to bring in the best online courses and um, challenges, online and offline challenges that Acton Academy has curated and sent to him in a modular way and piece together a school that before would have been impossible. Furthermore, the students of the school are arguably not going to be tethered to just the set of opportunities that a, that a comprehensive high school would even offer because they can reach out and take any number of different courses and access different apprenticeships and projects and learning activities, not tethered geographically. It's really because of the rise of online learning and its uniquely modular architecture that these kinds of micro schools are arising. Will you scroll to the next slide for me, Allison? So another example, this is the ICE school. It's based in Incline Village outside of Lake Tahoe in Nevada. And I actually met the founder of the school um, at lunch during one of the INICL conferences. So at Kevin Sullivan and I, as we talked, I thought, I am so fascinated by what you're doing. She's an entrepreneur who's opened this ICE school next to the public high school. And she um, offers, it's open 12 hours a day, six days a week. And students can come to the iSchool to take online courses. So in, as an enriched virtual or an a la carte, or just for homework help, they come sometimes during a free period during school or they come after school. It's another example of this kind of micro school opportunity that snaps together content and courses from a variety of different providers, including the public school across the street, but then also um, geographically distributed providers, and then provides a nice, warm, comfortable setting. They literally bring in grandparents to work at the iSchool to give these children um, some loving support while they're working. So then the last picture I, was, I wanted to show you, if you'll scroll to the next one, Allison, is uh, Jill Gertner in our community. Jill, I'm not, I'm not sure, I can't see everyone on the call right now, but if you're here, welcome. But this is her school, the Clark Street Community School. I was there just a couple months ago to do some filming for the micro credentials I'm gonna tell you about at the end of this call. But it's a similar thing. It's located across the street from the public school and it serves students in Wisconsin and they um, do a variety of online and face-to-face -face learning activities and it's very flexible. That student on the right, her name's Keisha. I found her on the 
Clark Street Community School blog. And she, her passion is working for the local community parks and recreation department after school. And she has to leave midday to get to that on time. And so the flexibility that Clark Street offers to allow her to do that, it's partly because of the autonomy of the school. So that's another reason that these micro schools are arising is that the classic theory of giving autonomy to these team leaders so that they can really reinvent what school looks like allows them to break away from the staffing and structures and and um, curriculum and programs that the mothership has put into place and do something much more disruptive. Jill, I do see you on the call. Welcome. Um, and so this, Jill, I'd love for you to pipe in and also add in the chat box, but I think this is an example of um, a public charter school that is akin to the same micro school movement that is that's benefiting from the modularity that we're seeing arise in the education sector that's allowing for these novel configurations of what the different components of school can look like when they're all put together um, by various actors coming together and reconfiguring school. So with that introduction uh, to micro schools and to the micro phenomenon that we're and modularity phenomenon we're seeing in education, I want to turn it to to Allison Powell now, who will talk about micro credentialing. I hope that her overview of that will be helpful to you because I think it's a very important trend to watch in education. Thank you. And Jill, did you want to say anything first? I know Heather gave you that opportunity. <laughs> Uh, my big thing would just be that for me, uh, what I love to talk about is the fact that we are redesigning the system so that it really can start with the student at the center. And by doing that, we're helping kids develop the skills that they need to be independent lifelong learners because they're putting together their program. We're giving them a system that allows them to do that. So thanks for the shout out, Heather, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Well, you're doing that. great work. It was really fun to be at your school and to see it and to see how you're rethinking the different elements of education and bringing them together in a way that your, your battle cry is that student-centered idea. And, and then because of the modularity, you're able to redesign in a way that serves that, that intention. Um, I wanted to mention too that let's just really use this chat box today during this so that if Allison's talking about anything that's not clear, um, I'll be managing that as she's talking and I might interrupt her a few times to just, um, and anyone is welcome to just unmute and, and get in on the discussion as well. Definitely. I'd rather have this be like a conversation than me talking at you. <laughs> um, but I think that was a perfect segue into what micro credentials are. So the micro schools and um, all the personalized learning we hear about um, lately is really focused on the students. And so with the micro credentials, we're starting with the adults and trying to modularize their professional learning. Although micro credentials are now moving into the student space as well. So, but we wanted to start with the adults um, with the micro credentials. So to get started, does anybody know what a micro credential is? What have you heard about them? You can either say talk into the microphone or in the chat area. Don't be shy. Allison, it sounds like we really need you. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I have good wait time. <laughs> Net said small chunks of personalized learning. Carol um, said, isn't it something around earning badges? Badges, yes. So the outcome, what you when you earn a micro-credential, you will get a badge. Drya says a way to demonstrate deep understanding of a, one topic or concept, and they are competency-based. Perfect, so you guys have a pretty good idea of the basics of a micro-credential. Um, kind of the definition for the field is that it is a micro-certification. So these aren't big online classes or degrees. Um, like Annette said, it's a very small chunk. You're going to focus on one particular competency um, or skill, and you have to create a portfolio of evidence showing that you're able to demonstrate that specific skill or competency. Um, and when you finish it and you're able to demonstrate it, you do earn a badge. Um, and so that badge you can share out with the rest of the world on your social media. You can add it to your resume, your email signature. 
Um, but that tells the world that you have been able to demonstrate um, one specific um, skill or area. And now we're starting to see as well, we'll talk about in a minute, that um, groups are putting together groups of micro-credentials or a cluster. And we haven't named it yet, but it could be like a macro badge <laughs> where you um, demonstrate a specific set of skills around a specific role within your district or school. Um, or around a specific topic area. Um, but the best analogy that I could think of for a micro-credential is learning how to drive a car. So when you're like 15, 16 years old, you get excited, I'm gonna go get my driver's license. Um, but there's lots of different ways to get your driver's license or to learn how to drive. You can go online and watch videos, read information about what the laws in your state are, what the different signs mean. I can sign up for driver's ed course. I can go practice with my mom or dad or older brother or sister, or maybe I'm moving from, um, I live in Arizona and maybe I'm moving to Utah. So I've been driving for 20, 30 years already. I just have to go learn a little piece of information. I just need to learn what the differences in the laws are. But everybody has to go demonstrate competency in order to get your driver's license. We all have to go down to the DMV and you have to take a written test that shows that you know what the laws are and what the signs mean. And then you have to get in the car with somebody from the DMV who has no vested interest in whether or not you get your driver's license. And they have their little clipboard with all the different things that you have to demonstrate and how you have to demonstrate them. And you have to go drive and show them that you can do these things. And Sometimes you get it. And like me, the first time I got my, went to go get my driver's license, I didn't pass. I couldn't parallel park. And so he did not give me the license. He said, go back and keep practicing. So I went and practiced with my dad every day after school until I could parallel park. And then I went back and tried again and was able to demonstrate it. And then they gave me my bright shiny badge or my driver's license that I shared with my family and my friends and if a police officer were to pull me over, I could show them that, hey, look, I have this. I've demonstrated how to drive. I know what I'm doing. And so that's very similar to a micro-credential. You're going to choose one skill or competency, and then you have to go practice, learn. Some of you may have been teaching in the classroom for a really long time, and you already know what these competencies are. So you don't have to learn as much as like a brand new teacher coming into this space. But we are moving away from the traditional sit and get PD and you can pick and choose how you're going to learn it. You can go choose to sit in a traditional PD course or you can just go practice, demonstrate, but everybody has to collect evidence and show that they can demonstrate it and then you get that bright shiny badge. Um, any questions so far? I love the idea that if you've already learned how to drive when you move to a new state you don't have to take all of the driver's ed again and that's a yeah. key that's really the heart of this is that it's competency based in that way if you're already competent you just show what you know and get the same certification yeah um and so um we've come together um at the field that we've been working on micro-credentials for I think the last three years um, and they look a little bit different than when we first started. Um, this is a new thing and so we've been learning a lot along the way um, but all micro-credentials kind of follow the same blueprint. Um, in, in the beginning we had fun creative educators like to be creative in naming their micro-credentials so we found that like we just need to be straightforward and so all micro-credential titles, I start with the action because there's a lot of different things that you could do to demonstrate a specific um, competency. So the action that's um, verb that starts the title of a micro-credential is the way you have to demonstrate that competency. So if the competency was agency in this one, you have to show that you can nurture agency with your students. Um, also, we found a lot of the time that um, people are really busy or they don't like to read, so we've narrowed down <laughs> the, what the descriptions are um, into three sentences. So all micro-credentials have kind of the three just sentence description um, that follows the same 
um, template where the first sentence is always going to be the definition of that specific competency. So depending on where you're at in the country, in your state, in your district, around the world, um, we all define things a little bit differently. So we wanted to have a clear definition of what that um, competency means for this particular um, micro-credential. The second sentence, there's any key underlying principles. So this is, so the first sentence is the what, the second sentence is usually kind of the how, like what are the different strategies you're gonna use in order to demonstrate this competency? And then the third sentence is the rationale. Why is this micro-credential or this competency important to me and my specific role? Like why do I need to know how to be able to demonstrate this? Um, so this is an example of one of the micro-credentials that Heather wrote. Um, and her title and description. Um, and the micro-credentials are created by a variety of different organizations and partners. So we go out and find experts um, in the field and organizations that um, are defining these competencies. Um, and they're the ones that are writing these micro-credentials and putting them together. Um, so Heather has created a set that she's gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, and then each micro-credential has a badge over here. And when you earn it, this magical little banner comes across the top and has the title showing that you've actually earned it. Um, and they do have a lot of metadata in the background. So once I earn it, I can share it out um, and you can see what I had to do in order to earn that micro-credential. So it's not just a picture that I can cut and paste and put all over the internet. They actually have um, that data in the background of it. Um, all micro-credentials, and for most of you that have been in the online learning world are probably familiar with the ADDI instructional design model for building online courses. Um, we kind of adopted that and translated it as it is a kind of a learning cycle. Um, so we're using that for the development of micro-credentials and what the requirements are that you have to demonstrate. So all micro-credentials have at least four and some have five things that you have to do in order to earn it. Um, every time, every micro-credential, you have to analyze something. This could be your current practice, a set of data, a situation from your past, but you're gonna analyze something to kind of set that baseline for the rest of the micro-credential. So you'll do the analysis um, and then you're gonna create something. And this is kind of where the job embedded piece comes in. Um, these are, if you're a teacher, maybe it's designing a lesson plan or you're designing an assessment. Or if you're a teacher leader or a leader in the schools, maybe it's an agenda or um, a new policy or practice. Um, but you're gonna create something and sometimes that's two things. So some micro-credentials, you'll create one thing, sometimes it's two, that's the design and develop. And then all micro-credentials, you have to go implement it. It's not good enough to just understand the micro-credential, but you actually have to go put it into your practice um, and collect evidence that you did implement it. And then finally, you'll evaluate your implementation. Um, how did it go? Um, what did you learn? And how are you gonna change your practice in the future based on what you just did? Um, so you'll complete all those things and as you're going, you're collecting evidence along the way. So sometimes you're gonna be recording yourself, um, collecting student work, you might have to write a narrative, but those narratives are usually like three to 500 words. So these aren't like dissertations that people have to write. It's usually really just like a reflection of what you're doing um, or the analysis. So it's not a huge heavy lift. Um, but each micro-credential, it varies on the types of evidence that um, you're going to be collecting along the way. That's a kind of high overview of what they look like and what you're doing. Are there any questions about the micro-credentials there so far? They're quiet. <laughs> All right. Well, then... Kind of the process for people going through these, um, sometimes the districts choose the micro-credentials. We're doing a lot of um, strategic um, implementations of these. Um, so sometimes it's the, the educator's choice, sometimes it's the um, school or the organization's choice, um, but we do a lot of support along the way with them. So you're, um, you could, do these in PLCs face-to-face. -face. Um, we have opportunities for you to engage online in discussions, but we found that doing them on your own 
isn't always the best strategy, especially that first one. It's good to collaborate with others, but then you're practicing doing it, collecting the evidence, and then you go and upload your evidence. And there's third party reviewers. So these people don't, it's all done anonymously. You don't know who's um, giving you feedback. They don't know who you are unless you tell them specifically, but they'll give you feedback on each particular requirement. And if you um, get, if you demonstrate all of them, you earn your badge. If you don't, we found on average, it takes about one and a half submissions in order to earn your micro credential. Um, so not everybody earns it the first time. They are pretty rigorous. Um, but if you don't earn it, you just resubmit the pieces that you didn't demonstrate. So you don't have to resubmit the whole thing again. Um, and we've found lots of different incentives that um, people are giving. You can earn like the continuing education units. We've partnered with a lot of universities to give grad credits, people are rethinking their whole career pathways and changing salary schedules and licensure around all of this. So there's a lot of different incentives now. So that earning that badge actually means something rather than just, I demonstrated it. We know all that intrinsic motivation is great, but people want something else as well with it. Um, and then the last thing is that we've kind of some lessons learned with implementing these across different organizations. Um, we call these our VIPs, um, is that there has to be some kind of a reason why you're implementing micro-credentials. Like if you're trying to solve a problem, um, but it needs to be a shared vision across the organization rather than just one person being excited about it. Um, like I just said, incentives are key as well, especially when you're first getting started. At first, we thought if you build it, they will come and do these, and that wasn't the case. Like, there has to be a characteristic. Um, and to start small, find that one group of educators, leaders that can really test this out. Don't try to do it across the whole organization um, for your first group, and then providing that system of supports. Um, whether it's coaching, mentors, um, office hours, or facilitated discussions, there's all kinds of different ways um, celebrating people and their successes along the way. Um, but just to support them and not just say, here's a micro-credential, go do it, because it is a different way of thinking about professional learning or just learning in general. So that's all I have for you. Allison, that was such a helpful overview. Thank you. And I love how... Um, organized and and improved upon this is I've been talking to Bloomboard for a few years now and it's been fun to see the evolution and how how well you've incorporated just learning science into the design we our time is up everyone in one minute with your permission I'd like to go for an extra five minutes and so if you need to log off please do I will not be offended but uh, there I just want to tell you the so what about this and why it is that I've asked Allison on the call. So, um, and here's the reason why is that my, in my experience, as I have been out on the road doing blended learning live and teacher booths and other presentations and professional learning, and you have been doing that work as well. And you maybe are experiencing the same thing. What I see is that teachers and leaders, um, exit the professional workshop, the develop, professional development workshop and feel like, gosh, this is great. I'm starting to have a strategic plan, but how about my teachers? How about the people that are on the ground, my principals? How do I help them get the skills that they need to implement my design or the design that our teams came up with? And it's a different design for each team. As you know, they're all doing their fast pitches. They're all coming up with their own designs, but they come up with different designs. And that's the beauty of it is we're in this phase of really beautiful, messy innovation and so there's not a one size fits all, okay, here's your next step. And so that was really a puzzle for me for a long time as I thought, how do we provide support now as teams leave with their plans and they know what they wanna do, but they don't have all of the different skills or competencies they need to develop to deliver their plan. And what emerged for me was we need a set of a menu of competencies so that each team can choose the path that's right for them. So that if one team says, I'm gonna move out and start an enriched virtual school like the Clark Street Community School, they're gonna choose a different set of competencies than if it's a team of third grade teachers that want to do a station rotation 
It's a very different set of competencies that are needed. So we needed a, a broader menu and more modularity so that educators could, in a modular way, create their own stack of micro-credentials to learn the competencies that they need to deliver their plan. So that was the vision behind it. Elson, if you'll scroll to the next slide. As a starting point for that, you know, great contact information. Um, I've worked with uh, Sammy Forsters on this call and John Jacobs and Don Nordine and the wonderful people at the Wisconsin eSchool Network and the Wisconsin Digital Learning Collaborative to create seven micro courses that are a starting point and they're all structured according to the Addy model. Allison's actually collaborated with me on these seven and these are the seven that we'll start with. Uh, the reason we chose these seven is I, I think all of you'll remember when we did focus groups and surveys and lots of conversations around what are your needs? What are the main things that you need? And the number one that we heard was communicating the why of student-centered learning. We need buy-in, we need help with buy-in. So that was the one we did first, followed closely by growth mindset and nurturing agency. And then how do I help my teachers shift into their new role? And the main things that they would master for that would be learning how to move from stand and deliver instruction to more of a coaching role where they're giving feedback and building relationships of trust. So all of these yellow ones are aligned with helping teachers and leaders shift their role into a more student-centered role or vision for themselves. Um, Allison, if you'll go to the next slide. So, there are three access options that we're just, we're, we're in the messy phases of innovation right now, but I will be partnering with Bloomboard. So they already have these seven and I'll be developing more. And so Ready to Blend will be one of the, uh, one of their content partners and they'll, Bloomboard will be doing the review and the facilitation for those micro credentials. And we're planning to have those available through Bloomboard beginning in March. A second option is that all of these micro courses are now available for those of you that are part of Wisconsin and the WDLC. They're available for you through um, the WDLC network. So through John and Sammy, you can access those courses and Don, um, and they'll be served up on Buzz. At this point in time, we don't have reviewers to certify completion of and, and attainment of the micro credential, but the courses themselves are accessible as well as the rubrics behind them. So any individual school district, for example, could take one of those micro courses through the WDLC and provide their own review using those rubrics and certify micro credentials. So those first seven are available and we'll be, um, we'll be debuting those in April, when I'm out at the Harley Davidson Museum, we'll be doing some live face-to-face -face work to jumpstart progress on, on one micro course per participant. So that's something that we'll announce more for those of you in Wisconsin. And then the third option is pro games. And this is something that I'm working on in collaboration with Bloomboard, where if you want to take the do the standard Bloomboard micro credential, you can. Um, if you want to do it as a cohort and in a gamified way, where it's three weeks, we work together online for three weeks, we get it done. There's points, there's prizes, there are escape rooms. That's pro games. So it'll be an opportunity to complete the micro credentials, but in a gamified way with a cohort. And so I'll give you more information about that soon, but I wanted to at least show you our new logo and show you that that's on the horizon. I really believe when it comes to professional development that the more we can simulate student-centered learning that's fun and engaging, the better. So we've really tried to build those principles into Blended Learning Live. And I wanted to hold off on, on micro-credentials until I found a way to do it that seemed learner-driven, learner-centered, fun for the learner. And so that's what programs is going to be all about. I'm actually running it on the Brain Chase platform. So for those of you who are familiar with Brain Chase, we'll be doing repurposing Brain Chase, reskinning it with ready to blend logos and using it for adult learners now to make micro credentialing fun. So that's the idea behind it. We'll do a beta test in March and then roll it out more broadly in April. We'll give you more details soon, but I just wanted to make sure that you had an overview of some of these opportunities and where we're heading with modularity in education and the reason why it's becoming more of a micro phenomenon. 
Um, are there any questions here? I'm going to let glance at this chat box or if anyone want to pipe up and ask a question. So Allison, a question from Jeff. He said, um, he's wondering how far you go with learning scaffolds with the ADI sequence for each evidence criteria. Also interested to hear more about how you support organizational leadership to get started with supporting micro-credential achievement with a community approach. Yes, so I can try to answer these questions super quickly, but it might be better to go more in depth, but just a high level overview. Um, we sit down with each as we're developing the micro credentials we kind of have the template um, like the high level template but they all kind of end up a little bit different um, in terms of how we set up the requirements for each one so like when heather and i sat down um, we really like write out the description first like what is it that you're trying to do and then what does the evidence look like for each of in order for somebody to demonstrate this and then kind of what it, we go back then into the process of how what is the process for them to be able to um, demonstrate each of these steps along the way and set them up for success so, um, so and then pull together all of the learning resources as well and so it kind of it depends on each micro credential um, there are like we've pulled together a lot of different um, things that we've seen um, on types of evidence to collect um, and that kind of it helps but it also kind of backfired like for analyze we saw like oh everybody has a narrative for analyze <laughs> and like we want to switch that up a little bit and so we've kind of gone back oh, last week we had a retreat with my team and just like analyzed all of the micro credentials and where we were at and like how can we go deeper and find different ways to demonstrate it so not everybody has to write a narrative every single time because that kind of defeats the purpose of personalized and competency-based learning as well and so we're we're still exploring that piece on the writing and what that looks like for each step um, I think we've got the template of what it looks like and I can go deeper like if you want to set up a follow-up call and kind of go deeper into what that process looks like yeah um, I'll save the I'll save the group some time Allison um, I, I appreciate you going into that I know it's like a deeper conversation my curiosity lies at exactly what you're talking about is like the core we want to create a, um, a space where the learner has like basically the scaffolds of like what the evidence criteria should be but then have like free reign of medium, how much like volume, depth and everything like that. And then in a lot of ways, like to step outside the, um, the you know, the, the learning resources, even that you provide them, right? And, um, you know, I've just found that like, it's, while it's a noble challenge and we should tackle it, it sometimes it's difficult for learners who like require heavy, heavy scaffolds or not necessarily require or just like more used to like linear, like proceeding through learning in a linear one size fits all manner. Um, and so that's, it, I, I'll be interested in setting up uh, sometimes just to talk to you more about that. And that would follow up into the community supports because I think that that's a big thing that's missing when you just put out for self discovery um, is that, uh, um, you know, we know that professional learning best practice is that like uh, uh, community learning is, it, it, it's very, very helpful and within the context of, um, uh, you know, the teaching and learning environment and, and everything like that. It, it's helpful to be authentic to do that with your peers. So, um, yeah, I'll follow up with you with your with your email. But I just appreciate you um, kind of tackling that for me because um, something that you know I'm working through right now of how you construct that with what's the Goldilocks test for what's enough <laughs> exactly. scaffolds and what's too much. Exactly. So yeah, I'd love to talk more. And for anybody, feel free to email, and we can set up more time. And we'll be sharing more about our collaboration in the weeks ahead, but I wanted to make sure the facilitators had a sense ahead of time of the theory behind it and some of the context behind it because you are the um, experts in this. And so I wanted to give you that deeper background knowledge so that as you're starting to see news about this, you know where my mind was with it, why it's really compelling to me, why I believe in this work, why I feel like it's the right thing for educators and it's the right thing for 
breathing flexibility and options and fun into professional learning and taking it to the next level as we're helping our teams move from design into implement. This is the key strategy for moving from design into implement. And so it'll be an important one for us all to track. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for your extra time today. I think it was worth the extra investment of a few minutes because this was pretty content rich. And I hope um, you have a wonderful Friday, a great weekend ahead, that your February feels shorter than January and that um, the sun comes out a little bit for those of you in the nor northern states. Um, all of my best to you. We're, we're always here for you, so please reach out. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.